It's so amazing what humans can do nowadays. We're launching ourselves off of our planet. We're leaving our world. Venturing past the moon is a major breakthrough for mankind. Are we ready? Well, we're really not. In March 2020, Elon said that if the current pace of innovation doesn't pick up, he'll be dead by the time humans get to Mars. He was referring to rocket technology, but what about the other stuff, like life support? What about radiation protection? Scientists, engineers, and brilliant people like Musk are working day in and day out on all of these things, but there's one thing you don't hear about them working on. Artificial gravity. Our bodies run tons of background tasks that we don't even realize or think about, and they're all affected by gravity. I mean, have you ever floated in a pool for too long, swimming? Gravity kind of hurts when you get out. From the fluid in our eyeballs to the mass of our bones, from the blood circulating to our faces and brains to our cardiac muscle tissue. All of it is greatly affected by the force of gravity that constantly pulls on us and all of the cells in our body while we're on the surface of the Earth. Astronauts on the International Space Station are orbiting the Earth along with their vessel, so gravity just keeps them in orbit instead of pulling them down towards the floor of the space station. This is why they spend four hours a day vigorously exercising, but they still grow weak and they can't even keep up with a regular person on Earth who doesn't even consciously work out. I say consciously because every morning when you get out of bed, your muscles have to fight against the gravity of the Earth to stand up. Learning about the devastating effects of Scott Kelly's year in space is quite sobering. 48 hours after returning to Earth's gravity, he was struggling to stand. Every part of his body hurt, and he was nauseated and felt awful. It was even a struggle for him to remain conscious. At times he felt hot, but his skin was ice cold. And when he stood up, all of the blood would rush to his legs, giving him the sensation of doing a handstand, but in reverse. According to him, at one point, looking down at his legs, he saw swollen alien stumps, and not legs at all. His ankles were squishy like water balloons. Take a look at any footage of astronauts returning from space missions, and you'll see a similar struggle. Some humans are incredibly resilient survivalists, but the human body should be considered a very delicate, squishy piece of equipment. Not everyone is built the same though, and I think it's fair to point out that some humans are more fit and resilient than others. Some astronauts even do better than others when returning from space. This is footage from February 6, 2020. Christina Koch returned after 328 days in space, and you can see the care taken here to comfort her as they bring her into the medical tent to check on her. I'm actually surprised at how well she coped with returning to Earth's gravity after such a long mission in space. She claims that she had some difficulty with her muscles, especially those that support her spine and her back, but it wasn't too long after landing that she was upright and greeting her dog. I haven't seen any footage of her from this time just standing up, but she certainly looks strong here. Now imagine a regular person like yourself, and let's say 99 other humans, landing on Mars after a six-month journey without artificial gravity. You land on the planet, and you have no one there to even help you stand up. Well, I guess the crew would spend a couple of hours or days just to lay back in their flight chairs and eventually recover, right? Especially because Mars is a less massive planet than the Earth, it will only be pulling down on the crew with 38% of the gravity force that the Earth does. Well, this will seem nice at first, Aside from having to learn how to walk around a little bit differently and not jump too high, the crew should be able to acclimate to Mars's weaker gravity more quickly than if they had landed on Earth. Hopefully after a few hours of rest, the crew will begin standing up and become Homo erectus once more. The crew will then live on Mars for the next one and a half years. At least that's what the mission plan currently is, which is smart. The crew will conduct scientific research, explore, and just try to stay alive on Mars, breathing air from tanks, eating food from cans, and sheltering themselves from radiation. One and a half years later, the planets will align into positions that are perfect for a return journey to Earth. At this point, the crew will launch themselves off of Mars and head Earthward. Of course, as with all of our space travel using our current level of tech, they will have just enough fuel to escape from Mars's gravity and float through space orbiting the Sun on a collision course with the Earth. Instead of spending fuel that it doesn't have to achieve an orbit around Earth, their spacecraft will then directly enter the Earth's atmosphere, which will cause it to slow down in relation to the Earth like a skydiver, eventually achieving a speed slow enough to flip around and propulsively land on the Earth's surface. This is the point in the story where some of the crew may die. I would put my money on heart failure. Am I being too extreme? Perhaps, 
Maybe no one dies, but the chances of immediate death have just risen by a lot. Think about it. Humans have never ever done this before. No one has ever been past the moon and the longest ever space mission for a human has been a little over a year in low earth orbit, still shielded by the Earth's Van Allen radiation belt. Now we're talking about one and a half years of 38% gravity sandwiched by two six month periods of just floating, exercising with rubber bands. I hope by now that you're starting to realize that this is a real issue that no one's really talking about. Also, there are other positives to having artificial gravity, so I'll just name a few here. Plants. They like to grow upright, away from the floor. With no gravity, there is no floor. Bathroom use. Imagine aiming your turds. Sex. Well, see my other video about that. Eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Just look at it. Sleeping. Messes, spills, fires, explosions, cooking, periods, showers, pouring coffee? All right, well, you get the point. Now let's talk about what we can do about it. There are a number of possible solutions to the problem, but let's start with everyone's favorite, constant acceleration. In a fantastic TV show called The Expanse, the characters traverse our solar system using a rocket propulsion system that is so efficient, it can constantly provide acceleration during the whole trip. Acceleration, not maintain speed, but acceleration. This is important. It's incredibly clever. To mimic the Earth's gravity constantly pulling the crew down, the inverse happens. The floor of the spaceship constantly pushes up against their feet. During launch, the ship is traveling nose first, and while standing up, the crew is traveling head first. The effect should be about the same as real gravity, as long as the ship is constantly accelerating with exactly the amount of force you would experience from real Earth gravity. Sounds good, right? Well, don't forget that as the ship continues to accelerate, its speed is actually increasing faster and faster and faster. The feeling one might get is that of riding a bicycle or skateboard down a hill, the kind of hill that just keeps on speeding you up. This is not a good look for arrival at a destination, but that's why we have brakes on the bicycle. And you know that feeling of deceleration when you hit the brakes, right? Well, constant acceleration artificial gravity uses a maneuver that happens halfway through the trip. The engines get turned off and the crew loses their artificial gravity briefly while the spaceship flips around. Now the spaceship is traveling butt first. And if you picture the crew inside standing upright, they're traveling feet first. The propulsion system fires once again, acting as a braking system, constantly providing what is now a deceleration. If the maneuver is done correctly at exactly the halfway point of the journey, the ship's velocity will be approaching relative zero as it reaches its destination. Of course, the flight plan can be tweaked to achieve a particular velocity that matches whatever the destination is, be it an orbit, a rendezvous, or atmospheric entry. Well, that was fun talking about fairy tale stuff, but it's now my duty to inform you that this is a pipe dream, and if it becomes possible, we're quite a ways away from developing such a system. The acceleration is not the main problem. The propulsion systems that we currently have are in fact able to push us forward at an acceleration equivalent to 1G. 1G is what we call the amount of gravity force equal to the force that the Earth pulls down on us with. The problem, though, is sustaining that acceleration. The best we can do is sustain forward propulsion for mere minutes. And that's using rockets that are almost entirely fuel tanks. You see, rockets are generally at least 85% fuel. Take a second to picture that. On the other end of the spectrum, a car's total potential mass is made up of only 4% fuel and 96% of its weight for structure and payload capability. Airplanes, 30 to 40% of that mass is fuel. Rockets are for the most part almost all fuel in comparison, and to begin a trip to Mars for example, a spacecraft would burn most of that fuel in just a few minutes. Then it would float for the rest of the way in an orbit around the sun. In order to make a constant acceleration gravity system work, we would need a propulsion system that can constantly fire, and keep firing for weeks at a time, not just minutes. It just can't be done with the chemical propulsion systems we have available. There are ideas out there for fusion drives, but in 2020, it's still science fiction. Switching gears, I've heard a lot of talk about magnets. Some people have asked, why can't we just wear a thick metal suit and have magnets on the floors? Well, if designed correctly, something like that could stop you from floating. For example, the maglock boots in the expanse are pretty cool. But floating isn't the problem. The human body would still suffer from the effects of microgravity. Also, living that magnetic life sounds very uncomfortable. 
There are plenty of other ideas that range from interesting to ridiculous, but with our current level of technology, the most realistic way for SpaceX to deal with the whole no gravity in space issue is spin gravity. Most people don't understand that acceleration is a term in physics that means any change in speed. According to science, even slowing down or turning left and right are considered accelerations. One of the rules of physics that we're forced to work with is that we don't actually feel speed, we only feel acceleration or changes in speed. This is what objects look like traveling at slow, medium, or even fast speed. Check it out, yeah, nothing's happening. This is what objects look like when an acceleration acts upon them. When you're driving in a car on the highway, you know you're going forward, right? You feel the bumps, the suspension, and the wheels on the road for sure. But in space, there is no bumpy pavement. If a car on the highway takes a left turn, your body as a passenger feels that acceleration force and will sway to the right. Well, now imagine constantly taking a left turn and standing upright with your feet on the inside of the car door. This is how spin gravity works, or as it's more formally called, centripetal acceleration. The word centripetal refers to the force of the floor pushing upwards towards your feet, or in other words, the outer edge of a spin system being pulled inwards as it spins. It's being pulled by the connection it has with the center of the spin system. You can think of this as working against its opposition, centrifugal force. Centrifugal force is a force that presses your feet down towards the floor. If the connection with the center of the spin is broken, the centripetal force will cease to exist and the centrifugal force will cause the outer edge of the spin system to fly away. Spin gravity actually has been experimented with and achieved, to a very minute extent, by the Gemini program. The Gemini 11 mission was able to generate a tiny amount of artificial gravity, about 0.00015 g, by firing their side thrusters to slowly rotate crafts connected with a 36 meter tether. On Earth, we've done a lot of experimenting with spin gravity, including carnival rides, which apply more than 1 g of force on the humans inside. Spin gravity does create some problems, most notable is the Coriolis effect. That's where you see the difference between centripetal force and actual gravity. There are tons of Coriolis effect explanations out there if you want to learn more about it and why it's a thing. Thankfully, the Coriolis effect becomes mitigated more and more the larger the spin system is. As soon as your system becomes 200 meters plus, you can rotate it at lower RPM to achieve artificial gravity with minimal Coriolis effect. Alright, so we know artificial gravity is necessary. I find the most compelling option is a spin system that not only spins to create gravity, but allows an entire existing spacecraft to spin around the circumference of the system. This way, you don't have to redesign the entire spacecraft or design a new one. Although I do have some ideas for all new spacecraft designs in my mind, and I will be making videos about them in the future. Will there be technical hurdles and other considerations? Of course, tons of them. Keeping radio antennas pointed towards the Earth for communication, keeping shielding against solar wind pointed towards the sun, backup systems, gravity differences between decks, deployability and reusability, and don't forget about the tennis racket theorem, also known as the Janibikov effect. And that's just to name a few issues that any designs need to consider. In 2019, I came up with my own design for a spin system based off of SpaceX's Starship, and I call it the GLS. The core concept of the GLS is to utilize an additional Starship to carry the mass of a deployable spin system structure so that the spin hardware may be pushed to a destination and reused on the way back. If you want to hear more, check out my GLS video where I describe everything in detail and illustrate the spin action with 3D graphics. I'm still working on new, more simplified versions of the design, so subscribing and turning on notifications is the best way to support and follow my progress. Remember, the hurdles that humanity has overcome to achieve spaceflight have been daunting. Just to get humans to space and not fall back down, boosters had to be designed to achieve a speed of 17,000 miles per hour. And now we're landing our boosters side by side using rocket propulsion. I don't think comfortable spin gravity is too much to ask for. Alright, well thanks for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed it. Open your mind and reach for the stars.